Hello, everybody, and welcome in to eBible Fellowship's continuing Bible studies into the book of First Samuel, heard at this very same time, Monday through Friday. And we thank you for being with us wherever you are and however you're listening to us, either through eBible Fellowship's webcast audio or through Skype or perhaps through Pal Talk or even over the phone. And we pray that the Lord's blessings will be with us over the next 30 minutes or so as we now prepare to open our Bibles and introduce. Chris McCann. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our continuing Bible study in the book of 1 Samuel. We're presently in chapter 2, and uh, we're, let's see, let's take, let's begin tonight by reading verse 7. Jehovah maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are Jehovah's, and he has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For, for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of Jehovah shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. Jehovah shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. And I'll stop reading there. That that um, would take us to the end of Hannah's prayer. And uh, the last several studies, we've been going verse by verse through this prayer that Hannah was moved to pray. And we're, we found that uh, with each statement, God is um, is really setting up a picture of the wonderful and glorious um, exaltation of his people when uh, the Lord Jesus has uh, provided salvation for them. But also God is um, giving us illustrations of those that have identification outwardly with the people of God and and their humiliation, the bringing them down, uh, the, the making them uh, lowly, as, um, as uh, we read here in verse 7, Jehovah maketh poor and maketh rich. And in the last study, we were, we were looking at that phrase, or those words maketh rich, and we saw in Proverbs ten twenty two that the blessing of Jehovah it maketh rich, and then we went to Psalm one thirty three three, which uh, tells us that Jehovah commanded the blessing, even life forevermore, and so ultimately, um, when we're talking about um, spiritual riches, the blessing of God, it involves salvation and the gift of eternal life. There are other blessings, but they're lesser. There are they're, they're blessings that uh, are given in time in this world. They're finite and temporal. But the blessing of, of the Lord that maketh rich, that, and, and that is uh, eternal riches, riches that that um, a person can never lose. That uh, is the true riches. And um, let, let's see. Let's go to another verse in Proverbs that discusses the the idea of spiritual riches in Proverbs chapter twenty three. And I'll begin reading in verse 1. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat. If thou be a man given to appetite, be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Now that's the first hint that we receive here um, when the Bible talks about meat at times. It it um, is uh, pointing to doctrine. Uh, you can 
you can compare Hebrews 13, 9, uh, where God makes that kind of a connection. And, and therefore, deceitful meat would be false doctrine and things that are not true that are said about the Word of God, the Bible, the, the uh, other kinds of Gospels. This is deceitful meat. And then in verse 4 of Proverbs 23, it goes on to say, Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. And, you know, uh, th this verse is telling us quite a bit. It's giving us a lot of information. Labor not to be rich. And normally, how is it that someone becomes rich? They labor. They work and earn money. And and uh, they uh, work very hard in long hours. And so they they obtain more and more money. And is God saying, well, don't do that? Don't do that? No, he, he's not saying that. They're, um, they're children of God, believers, we find in the Bible, that were very rich men, and they labored hard. Uh, they, they worked extremely hard, and God profited them uh, temporally, physically, as well as since they were uh, true believers, God profited them spiritually. So he's not telling us that. Well, it, there actually there is an element to that. Um, it is it is also true that uh, our motivation for our labor or behind our work is very important. Why do we work? Um, the way we do. Why do we work hard? Why, uh, if someone's making a lot of money, why are they doing it? Are they doing it for the money's sake? Are they doing it in order to to get a large bank account? Well, you, yeah, that that is contrary to the Bible. Well, how could that be contrary to the Bible? Because God tells us, and um, let me see, I think it's, Colossians. I hope I can find this verse. It um, in Colossians. Hmm. Uh, maybe. Uh, I think Ephesians. Ephesians. It, it is in Colossians, but I'll be able to find it a little easier in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 6, it, it says in um, verse 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord, and not to man, and that that's the the key. And there's a another verse that says, "Whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not to man." And that would include uh, our our labor, our work, when we're we're going to our job, and uh, we're getting paid for it. Well, the the boss. Um, is is expecting us to work hard, and so we want to work hard. But it, it's important for the underlying reasons why we're doing it. Now, would we want to listen to the boss and and do a good job for him? On, yes, but only insofar as God tells us to. He tells us to. Um, to give someone a good day's work for a good day's pay. And, and so uh, even that, the, the service goes to God and, and not to man. We don't serve man. We serve God. We serve God in our job, even though we're getting paid by someone else. Yet uh, we, we um, for instance, would do more 
than asked, will do more than um, the job calls for, but not so that, well, they take notice and and then uh, uh, they'll give us a, a nice raise later. That's That's laboring to be rich. That's laboring for money. But we do it because we want to glorify God. We we want to um, have a, a good, honest conversation. And it's the same thing no matter what we do. If, we're, um, if, if the believer is a housewife, well, she wants to take care of the house. She wants to do her, her work around the house as to the Lord and not to man. It, it covers every area of our life in everything that we do. And it is uh, what is known by theologians as the Calvinistic uh, work ethic. But it, that, that's just completely uh, a wrong description. It is the biblical work ethic. It is the work ethic that God lays out in the Bible, not Calvin. Maybe Calvin uh, noted it. Maybe he, he saw the verses that teach this. But uh, it, historically, it has been a fact that the, ch- the children of God are diligent workers, and they work heartily, and, and yet um, the, the purpose and the motivation behind that is not money. It's not money that causes them to uh, do good service, but it is to serve God. So when... Proverbs 23, 4 tells us, labor not to be rich. Well, that's, um, that's true. We, we don't want to do that, although there's nothing wrong with laboring and making money and obtaining wealth. But, but that should not be uh, what, what really motivates us. But really, God has a... a a deeper spiritual meaning for this because we work hard and we, uh, we obtain wealth. We, we get more money, which, uh, which provides more things for us. This, uh, this is laboring and riches come as a result. And it's the same thing spiritually when people put in their labor, their work, they they develop doctrine, they develop uh, gospels, teachings, ideas from the Bible, which does what? Well, it's it's teachings that um, that really bring salvation to themselves. They they labor. And they obtain spiritual riches. They, let's look at it this way. Someone goes into the Bible and studies. Now, spiritually, that's working. That, that's laboring. Um, you know, when God says in um, Thessalonians, when he tells us in... Um, Second Thessalonians chapter three and verse eight. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but we but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power to make ourselves um, to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any man would not work neither should he eat and this uh yeah it has application to uh someone who refuses to do work in the world uh, there is a principle there but more than that if someone is not willing to work spiritually in the gospel well neither should he eat we we have to find our own bread remember the the bible is spoken of as daily bread. And and so that spiritual principle is laid out here. For It goes on to say in verse 11, For we hear that there are some 
which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy buddies. These are people who they're they're uh, on the surface of the scriptures. They really don't bother to uh, check things out like a Berean to see if it's so. They don't bother to uh, do a Bible study. They're they're just um, surfing. They're surfing on the face of the Bible, and they never dig in. Now, them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. And this is God's command by the Lord Jesus for you and for me and for every believer. We are to quietly work. Why quietly? Well, because spiritually we're in the place uh, as of a woman. We're the bride of Christ. We're not to speak or use Surf authority over the man who is God. No, that's why God get, uh, has given that command to women that they are to uh, learn in quiet and and not speak. It's an illustration to all the believers. That's exactly what we're to do when we approach the Bible. We never want to be the one who who is, is, has taken the lead, who, who has taken the authority over the man, who is God the Holy Spirit. Never. We want God the Holy Spirit, the man, to do the teaching, and he does when we compare Scripture with Scripture, the Holy Ghost teacheth. And, and, and so that's how we work in the Bible with quietness. And when we're not following that methodology, we're not following the way that God has outlined, here a little, there a little, then we're beginning to um, be like a woman that is teaching. We're beginning to uh, not work quietly at all. And, and so this is what the Lord would have us to do, every single child of God. Go to the Bible and and um, uh, read and and study. Check out verses. Check out what we're hearing to see if it's so. And and pray for wisdom. God would have us to do this, and then we can have our daily bread. We can eat our own bread, and and we can be about our work, busy in our work, heartily as to the Lord, and and uh, rather than being busy buddies uh, <laughs> that that word it, it it's really very descriptive someone who's not working at all they're disorderly they're a busy buddy they're in everyone's business that they're um here uh in getting into business they shouldn't be in and they're talking about things they shouldn't be talking about they're they they should be in the bible well, going back to Proverbs 23, verse 4, labor not to be rich. We do not want to involve our own works in any kind in order to uh, bring spiritual riches to ourselves. We work in the world. We obtain money, which, which uh, brings wealth to us or riches. But when it comes to the spiritual realm, when it comes to the kingdom of heaven and, and the Bible, God is very clear. We can do no work of any kind to further our cause, to obtain grace. The moment we add the slightest bit of work, we've perverted the gospel of grace and we, we've added uh, a fly to the ointment of the apothecary, and it be immediately begins to send forth a stinking savor. The slightest bit, the the smallest effort, such as the, the man who picked up a few sticks on the Sabbath day. And what was that sta Sabbath? 
It was to be a day of rest, a day of no work. And and he broke it. He violated it. And he did just a little work, not n- nothing too big, insignificant. And yet God had him stoned to death because it is a picture of someone who's trying to add just a little work of Oh, accepting Christ. Just a little work of, um, I, I got saved because I said the sinner's prayer, or anything, anything, no matter what it is. So labor not to be rich. We want to be rich spiritually. We we surely desire the bountiful riches that come with God's salvation. But God has to do the work. He has to be the one who who gives us those riches. And and uh, remember what we read in Revelation 3? In verse 17, Because thou sayest I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing. So th- this is someone who has labored um, in their doctrine, labored, and their church's confessions and creeds labored in their denominational theology. They've labored in all sorts of things, to, and they, they have brought spiritual riches to themselves. They're held in high esteem amongst their, um, the Presbyterians or amongst the Baptists or amongst the Lutherans uh, or amongst uh, their their fellow believers, they have a good reputation. They're men of renown. They're increased with goods. They have need of nothing. And yet, here's what God says. Here's the reality spiritually. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. That is, you're a sinner and you're in your sins, you've never left your sins, your sins are, are ever-present with you, and they, um, they, they uh, have, have destroyed your profession of faith. Uh, you cannot deceive me. You, you cannot uh, fool God, and, and even though you, you think you're rich and say you're rich, the fact is, you are impoverished. You are in sin and under my wrath. And, and that is the ultimate poverty. Now think of the rich man and Lazarus in the parable of uh, Luke 16. The rich man had all of his dainty meats. He ate well day after day. And, and yet what good did it do him? Finally, at the end, when his life came to a close, well, he died and was buried and ended up in hell, in the grave. And he had no Savior. He had no salvation. He, uh, he, he may have had physical riches, and that parable could also point to someone with um, uh, spiritual riches or professed spiritual riches like those in the church. But they weren't um, the true riches of God. And, and so he ended up poor. And on the other hand, Lazarus, physically a beggar, physically poor, physically sick, and, and had little of the world. Lazarus had the spiritual riches that only God can give. And that's what God says here in Revelation 3.18. I counsel thee. To buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyesalve, that thou mayest see. This is all what God has to do. And, uh, you know, this language, I counsel thee to buy of me. Remember, God likens himself to a merchant who um, he, he uses the language of buying and selling, but as he says in Isaiah, uh, buy without money and without price. God freely gives. 
his grace. He bestows his mercy um, on a on a sinner, and and that sinner doesn't do anything, uh, cannot really pay anything. It's just language that God uses. Well, um, now going just one more thing about Proverbs twenty three four. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. And this is another example of a Hebrew parallelism. The second part of the verse is really um, restating the first part of the verse. But here uh, it, it said actually in a more um, clearer way or plainer where God was talking about laboring not to rich. Now he's telling us what that means. That is cease, stop trying to obtain your own wisdom, that is, through your own effort, your own work spiritually in the Bible. But we need the wisdom of God. We need his spiritual riches. Going back to 1 Samuel and chapter 2. And the last part of verse 7, um, he bringeth low and lifteth up. Now, now again, God is making a point of stressing that he will bring the proud sinner down. He will abase him. This, This is in the future of every unsaved individual uh, as man naturally is proud and arrogant and and has lifted himself up in the sight of the Lord well God God will bring him down as we read in Isaiah chapter 2 it says in verse 11 no I'll start reading in verse 10 enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of Jehovah and for the glory of his majesty the lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and Jehovah alone shall be exalted in that day for the day of Jehovah of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low and upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up and upon all the oaks of Bashan and upon all the high mountains and upon all the hills that are lifted up and upon every high tower and upon every fence wall and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low. And Jehovah alone shall be exalted in that day. And that's referring to Judgment Day. Uh, this this is the, the will of God. Uh, he will bring everyone low who uh, has um, gone on uh, without him and, and has lifted themselves up. It's a biblical principle. We find it often in the Bible. God tells us repeatedly, and it's for our own good. He tells us this. He says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Um, submit yourselves to the Lord. And then he tells us, and he will lift us up. He will exalt us. That's one part of the principle is that if you go low, if you go down, then wait on the Lord. He will bring you up. But the other part of the principle is, and and we see this also throughout the Bible, those that go high as the eagle and exalt themselves up to the heavens, they that take the the highest or the chief rooms at the feast, they're they're the ones who um, who have a very high opinion of themselves. They're high-minded. There's all kinds of descriptions that God uses in the Bible to paint this picture of the proud man, the the proud man. Amazing that we're so proud. We're so um, proud that we have such pride that we we think we're um, so great, and and it it is uh, something that is 
within us. Uh, we, we have a natural tendency to um, think pretty well of ourselves and to think highly of ourselves. And this, um, uh, this also can be seen very much with, with uh, those that uh, involve themselves with the Bible or they begin to, to develop doctrines from the Bible. Uh, the man can't help it. If we're not born again, if we're not truly saved, then that um, that high and and lofty perch that we're on in our our in our spiritually dead hearts, um, it is going to show itself in our teaching, in our doctrines, and we'll come up with doctrines that that are wrong and uh, that that are sinful. They're contrary to the Bible. Now, everyone comes up with erroneous teaching. There's no one who has taught perfectly, no one who, who hasn't made a mistake. But the real problem comes when the Bible uh, makes a correction, when the Bible shows us the truth of a matter, and we refuse because we would have to come down. We would have to lower ourselves and submit to the Word of God and in order to make the correction. And this is not acceptable uh, oftentimes to the proud nature, the proud heart of man. But we'll, um, we'll discuss this more in the next study that we're going to have to end right now. Please uh, join with us tomorrow evening. Lord willing, as we continue the study in the book of 1 Samuel. You've been listening to eBible Fellowship's Chris McCann with his continuing studies into the book of 1 Samuel. These studies are heard every Monday through Friday night at this very same time over Pal Talk, over Skype, over eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over the phone. Lord willing, we'll have another Bible study for you tomorrow night into the book of 1 Samuel. And until then, may the Lord's perfect will be done. Good night.